I invite you now to hear these words. I read from the first couple of chapters of the book of Job. There was once a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. That man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. One day the heavenly beings came to present themselves before the Lord, and the accuser, ha Satan, also came among them to present himself before the Lord. The Lord said to ha Satan, well, where have you come from? Hasatan answered the Lord from going to and fro on the earth and from walking up and down on it. The Lord said to Hasatan, Have you considered my servant Job? There was no one like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. He still persists in his integrity, although you incited me against him to destroy him for no reason. Then Hasatan answered the Lord, Skin for skin. All that people have they will give to save their lives, but stretch out your hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse you to his face. The Lord said to Hasatan, very well, he is in your power, only spare his life. So Hasatan went out from the presence of the Lord and inflicted loathsome sores on Job from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. Job took a potsherd with which to scrape himself and sat among the ashes. Then his wife said to him, Do you still persist in your integrity? Curse God and die. But he said to her, You speak as any foolish woman would speak. Shall we receive the good at the hand of God and not receive the bad? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. Amen. Well, what I first noticed was the huge crowd of people. Uh, they, were, they were jammed into this, uh, this hospital waiting room. I, I'm sure the fire marshal would have thrown a fit if he saw it, because there were people just everywhere, all over the place. Uh, they had uh, they'd taken all their coats, and they'd thrown them on a few chairs in the corner, and the, they were all sitting around with each other. They'd brought in coolers of food. There were snacks and, and lunches and food all over the place. Uh, there, there were all kinds of people all sitting and talking to each other. But, but what I noticed second was the prayer. Lots and lots and lots of prayer. You see, what brought this family and this community together into this hospital waiting room was a, a car accident that had severely injured a young girl, a family member, a, a church family member. And so the, uh, the church family gathered now into this, uh, this, this space in order to come together uh, to pray. Doctors had, had done uh, all that they could. They, they felt like um, she had a, a bit of a chance, but things did not look good. Uh, they had done their best. They had done their work. But they tried to tell the family that, um, that her life hung in the balance. Uh, this family and this, this community uh, wanted to, to tip the scales. And so they, they came in droves. They came uh, in, in waves uh, again and again. New faces. Every time I went in the waiting room, I saw new people. They gathered together and they prayed they believed that, that, that their prayer was going to, to heal this child. Uh, they believed that, that indeed this was uh, an incredibly powerful opportunity for them to see God at work in their lives. Now, as a, a, a rather a green chaplain, uh, I walked into that not quite sure uh, what to do. I wasn't quite sure where to go in that space. First of all, I didn't know who to talk to first with all these different people all over the place. But then I, I didn't know where to go with them theologically. It seemed uh, that there was, there was only certainty there. They were absolutely certain that this child was going to wake up like the little girl in the scriptures did. It, and she was going to sit up and ask for some food. She was going to walk out of that hospital. And it was going to happen any day. And so any doctors or any nurses that tried to say, well, well, that may happen, that may not happen, even, even us chaplains, there was no room for that. There was no room for us. It was very clear, it became clear over conversations with them that, that, that they believed that if something happened, if this girl did not make it, it's because their prayers were not good enough. 
Uh, that God could do this, that God would do this, and it was up to them to say the right words, to live out their faith, and to believe beyond a shadow of a doubt that that child would live. Doctors, nurses, and even us chaplains were told to leave our doubts at the door. I was not on duty when this young girl died. It happened overnight. And first thing, I went back to, to check as I had for, for days and weeks and was shocked by the experience of an empty waiting room. The concert of prayer was over. They had packed up all their things and their coolers and their coats and their, their prayer and they had gone home. And I grieved deeply for this family and for this community. I grieved deeply because this little girl that, that was so precious to them was now gone. But I also grieved deeply wondering well, what would come to their faith? What did this mean about the way they, they understood God? What, what, what would they say about God in the midst of this pain, in the midst of this grief? They had been so sure. They had been so certain. Now what would they say about their prayers in the midst of them being unanswered? Perhaps those of us here today know full well the pain of unanswered prayers. We know what it feels like when, when we are just as fervent, when we are just as, as, as faithful, when we are just as certain that God will act in a certain way, in a certain place, in a certain time. You know, oftentimes when we will ask for prayer requests or, or we'll have a prayer chain, there are different uh, opportunities that we pray together. The, the, the most common thing that we, we see asked for is, is prayers for physical health, prayers for physical healing. Uh, that, that tops the list in terms of ways that we pray for each other, ways that we pray for ourselves. Um, we, we want, we want uh, health in those that we love and in ourselves. And so we pray for that. We pray with hope. We pray for expectation. Like this family in the hospital room prayed for significant and profound and miraculous health. But there are times that those prayers go unanswered. Uh, they're not answered in the way that we expect, in the way that we want, in the way that we pray. The cancer has come back. Mom doesn't make it to see the birth of her first grandchild. The child that we had prayed to live dies in the night. And we ask, God, where are you? What does it do to our faith? What does it do to our trust? What does it do to our prayers to a God who we believe heals? <laughs> we are not alone in our lives. The scriptures are filled with examples of unanswered prayers. Moses. Moses granted for health, uh, granted for uh, protection so that he could, he could walk into the promised land. Uh, it had been a generation, it had been years, 40 years that they had wandered together and he prayed to God that he might enter, that he might have the health and the strength and the vitality to walk into that place with them. And his prayer went unanswered. Uh, the Apostle Paul, we read again and again, he, there was something, a physical ailment. We don't know exactly what it is. He called it his thorn in the flesh. Uh, that, that he said, he prayed for God, take this away. I could be so much better of a missionary for you, God, he said. Take this away from me. Take this limitation away so that I can, I can do your work for you. And his prayer went unanswered. And even Christ, even Jesus on the night that he was betrayed, he went into the garden and he prayed. He prayed, uh, he prayed prayers of blood dripping from him. Let this cup pass from me. And his prayer went unanswered. 
Nevertheless, thy will be done. Well, this is a hard word for a lot of us to hear because we, we know it too well. We know of the pain of unanswered prayers or over the next couple of weeks. We're going to look deeply about this question, about what happens when our prayers aren't answered in the way that we want. Job. Job will be our teacher. He will be our guide. For in the pages of Job, we read again and again, answers or unanswered prayer, because this is really what the, is at the heart of Job. Now, now, some of you may not know the story so well. Let me uh, back up and uh, tell a little bit about the, the story. Uh, it begins there in the, the verse that I read. Uh, it's a, a man who was a, a rich and powerful and had a lot of children and was, a, uh, was very well taken care of in his life. And so uh, it says this about him, that uh, that man, Job, was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. Now, we don't know exactly when the book of Job was written, but a lot of scholars suggest that, that enough of the Bible had been written that there was this kind of uh, assumption uh, that, that when this word uh, heard, was heard by the first hearers of Job, uh, that, that this man was blameless and upright, they knew the rest of the story. They knew what the story was going to be because throughout the entirety of Scripture, we see what happens to blameless and upright people, right? We read the book of Proverbs. Those who are blameless, those who are upright, those who fear the Lord, those who walk in the ways of God, they will be blessed. They will be taken care of by God. Uh, we read in many of the Psalms, uh, you know, oh, how I love your law. Oh, how I love your commandments. It's the best way to live. It's the way that we are called to be as your people, God. Uh, and here in, in Deuteronomy, uh, it's another example. Throughout, throughout the book, uh, we read examples of uh, God basically telling the people, you know, if you do this, if you follow these commandments, you, it will go well with you. You will be saved. You will be protected. Uh, now, if you don't, However, if you are not blameless and upright, bad things are going to happen. For example, the Lord will strike you, says Deuteronomy. The Lord will strike you on the knees and on the legs with grievous boils of which you cannot be healed. From the sole of your foot to the crown of your head. It's clear, it's pretty obvious, it's there, it's in the scriptures. We know what the answer is going to be. And up until this point in the Bible, we knew what this was going to come to. Some bad stuff happens to those who are not upright, those who are not blameless. But those who are, it'll be fine. It'll be great for them. God's going to bless them. Bad stuff doesn't happen to good people. And then it does. The book of Job is jarring. And, and it's like a, a fingernails on a chalkboard of our theological assumptions. All of the bad stuff happens to Job. His children are killed in an accident. He loses all of his uh, possessions, all, of, all that he had. And then in this chapter we read how, how those head-to-foot boils that only happen to those who are not upright and blameless, all over. And within the first chapter and a half of the book, we find him sitting in the dust with a broken piece of pottery scraping the sores on his skin. It all happens to Job. Now, any good reader of Proverbs and Psalms and Deuteronomy know, know in a heartbeat that these things are clearly because he wasn't really blameless and upright. He didn't do it right. And that's the assumption of most of the rest of the people in the book. His wife does it here in the, the second chapter. He's not, she's not alone. Uh, his friends are going to make the same assumptions. They're going to say, well, clearly you're not as blameless and upright as we all thought you were. Because only blameless and upright people are given blessings and only uh, not upright people are given these punishments. You're punished, therefore it's easy. It's in the Bible. It's, it's, there's no ambiguity here. It's clear, they say. But then comes Job. Immediately, those assumptions are turned upside down. Immediately, according to this story, 
there's, there's this assumption, there's this, this new idea, there's this new uh, virus in the midst of what we thought was right and we thought was easy and we thought was unambiguous. Now what if there is a man who is blameless and upright and who suffers? What if the two don't go hand in hand? What does that say about our faith? What does that say about our prayers? What does that say about our God? That, that is the core and central question of the book of Job. And Job, here is this man who did not deserve the pain that he felt. He did not deserve this level of suffering. Yet, when he prayed for it to be removed, when he prayed for the safety of the people that he loved, those prayers went unanswered. No. Does that mean that we should simply give up on the life of prayer? Well, it didn't work, so why bother? Or does that mean that we have to go back and say, well, clearly we, get, we can figure out what Job did wrong. He wasn't nearly as blameless and upright as uh, maybe he thought he was. Or maybe, maybe the book of Job is about something else entirely. Maybe the end of the passage gives us a hint of where we're going in these next couple of weeks. For Job turns to his wife, who said all the right answers, by the way. She was the exact, correct, orthodox answer. And yet, Job calls her foolish. You speak as any foolish woman would speak. Shall we receive the good at the hand of God and not receive the bad? Echoes of chapter 1. Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. That, that is a grown-up prayer. That is a mature, adult, wise prayer. And that is what Job teaches us. Job asks us. Job really demands us uh, grow up. He demands a really mature uh, view of prayer that that asks us to do something that's difficult to do. You know, psychologists will will say, uh, teachers, counselors, etc. will say that one of the most difficult things as we, we grow, as we mature, is to be able to take two things that seem in opposition and hold them together in tension. To hold them together kind of as a polarity. Both of these things are true at the same time. Um, Harry, Emerson, Hemmer, Harry Emerson Fosdick does this with the life of prayer. Uh, Fosdick was a, a Baptist preacher and uh, a pastor at one of the biggest churches in New York City, Riverside Church, uh, for years and years. And he wrote a little book about prayer called The Meaning of Prayer. And it became this huge worldwide sensation. And uh, in it, he has some really incredibly profound uh, teachings on prayer. And one of his chapters, he has an entire chapter on unanswered prayer. What do we do when? What happens in the midst of prayers that we pray fervently and correctly and still are not answered? Um, and so he has uh, this, this very mature idea, does Fosdick, of holding together uh, two opposing ideas. Uh, here, here they are. So the, the first one is, is this, uh, is the, the clear assumption that prayer can bring results. Um, half of his book is about this. The work of prayer brings results. It makes changes in the world. Uh, prayer changes things. But then he says there's another truth as well. Prayer does not bring results. We know it, we've seen it, we feel it, so what do we do about it? And Fosdick reminds us that we have to keep both of these things in a very clear tension. That both of these things are absolutely true. That there, there are times that absolutely prayer can bring results, but there are also times that our prayers do not bring the results that we want, do not bring the results that we hope for. 
And so we have to hold both of these things together in tension. Now, uh, the, the simple among us will, will fall to one side or the other, suggests Fosdick. Uh, he, he suggests we need to walk a very uh, mature and very careful line in between these, right? If we, if we just fall to one side and say, well, prayer can bring results, so it always does. Uh, the prayer that we say always does exactly what we want it to, and therefore, if, uh, if it doesn't bring results, it's because your prayer is wrong. Uh, you did it wrong. You said it wrong. You're not living right. Somehow, the right prayer brings results. It's you that's the problem. Or, on the other side, another slippery slope is the, the one who says, well, well, see, look, prayer doesn't bring results, so why bother? Why even pray in the first place? Now, maybe prayer is nice. It makes you feel better about yourself, but it doesn't really bring results. It doesn't do anything. It doesn't make any changes in this world. Uh, Fosdick says, no, we have to hold them together. We have to understand the maturity of prayer that says we pray with hope and anticipation, and yet we know, we know that even in the midst of our unanswered prayer, God doesn't leave us. God never forsakes us. That is a grown-up prayer. That is an adult prayer. It takes some pretty mature thinking and some pretty mature trust. And so maybe that is the lesson for us today, when we suffer, when our prayers go unanswered, when our health or the health of those that we love is, is lost or is not all that we pray for, Job teaches us to trust. Don't look for what they did wrong. By all means, don't reject God. Don't stop praying. Just understand with mature wisdom that God loves us in the midst of the bad as well as the midst of the good. So over these next couple of weeks, we're going to come back to this. Fosdick has some good stuff to teach us. Job, oh, well, next week we're going to meet his friends, and we're going to hang out with them a little bit, and then we're going to finally hear in the last week the words of God in response to all of this. So uh, stay tuned. Uh, more questions. Um, maybe not all the answers, but at least we're faithful in the questions together. You know, that's my, my biggest regret. My biggest regret with the family there in that hospital room, I wish, I wish I could have been there with them in the end. I wish I could have been there not only in that moment, but in the moments following, not only in the moments following, but in the days and weeks and even months following. I wish I could have come and come to their church and, and spoken to them. I wish I could have come to, to speak to their pain. No, I wouldn't have all, had all the answers for them, but I, I would have told them that the, the questions are okay. Hmm. I wouldn't have been able to tell them why their prayers, our prayers for this little girl didn't work. But I would have told them, don't stop praying. I wouldn't have been able to take away their grief but I, I perhaps maybe could have asked them, don't add meaningless guilt about the way you prayed in the life you lived. I wouldn't, I hope, have uh, dared to speak with arrogance on behalf of God. However, I would have told them that my understanding and my belief in God is that God does not leave you in the bad or the good. That God is not absent even in the midst of the deepest pain. I would have told them that they, they are in good company. That the heroes of the faith lived through the pain of unanswered prayers. And they will too. Maybe that's the word that somebody here needs to hear. In the midst of your own unanswered prayers. Maybe in the midst of this pain. Maybe in the midst of whatever you're going through. Maybe it's not as bad as Job and you feel guilty about asking. But it still hurts. And so I hope you hear. Not that I could speak on behalf of God, but my experience has been <laughs> from the soles of my feet to the crown of my head that God will not leave you alone. God will be with you every step, every day.